at several U.S. museums uh, and public spaces, culminating uh, in the Amazing Spaces show in 1970 at the New York Museum of Modern Art, where we were, were memorialized in the, oh, that's our, this is our installation in the Sculpture Garden. Uh, we were rabbit free access, by the way. MoMA actually opened the garden to the public without admission during our show. Uh, we were memorialized in the Vogue, February 1970 issue with a photograph by the wonderful Irving Penn uh, of our group. I'm the young man in the upper left with the hoodie on. <laughs> <laughs> so it was in this early work that my love of computers, images, and open access uh, really developed. I went to California in 1973. I was almost 30 years old. The group broke up. We were a bit like a rock band, and seven years is a long time for that kind of collaboration. I worked briefly in San Francisco for a nonprofit foundation. And then I started a 20-year career in real estate development and finance, including a long association with Chuck Feeney, shown here in the picture, uh, and Chuck's company called General Atlantic Holding Company. Chuck made his initial fortune in duty-free shops. And in General Atlantic Holding, our job was to invest this substantial flow of income that Chuck had. Uh, working in real estate was a bit of a shock for after my art career, but it did allow for me to begin collecting maps. Feeney himself was a huge inspiration. He was an idealist who inspired in me many of the philanthropic values that I hold today. Feeney gave away not just 50% of his fortune, but 100% of all the assets he had in the holding company into what is now called Atlantic Philanthropies. He believes in giving while living, meaning he's spending down through gifts his entire fortune in the charity. He's given five and a half billion to date, and he has two billion to go. It, it's an amazing story. I encourage you to look at the website. And it had a profound influence uh, on me. So, this period of my life was one of my most ardent collecting. Here's my map library in San Francisco. You can see I indeed filled it up. Uh, I amassed the maps that I have during this time. I also did cataloging. And while learning about business and philanthropy, I was dreaming about new ways to reinvent myself and start something new. So in 1995, at age 50, I began, I retired from business. And I began my third career as, as a uh, working with emerging digital technologies, internet technologies, library volunteering, philanthropy, and the digital database itself as an art form. I was fortunate to be able to encompass all these things by building up a digital online library of my now considerable map library. And through that activity to find my way into software, GIS, library boards, and ultimately to my growing relationship with several libraries, including the JCB. Here, I've been in several capacities, a reader, a board member, speaker, digital advisor, and sponsor. I've come to take pride in the value that JCB embraces, learning, technology, love of books, collaboration, entrepreneurship. These are some of the va same values that inform my own life journey. For me, the JCB, embodies the best in reverence for the artifact, whether a book or a map. As we move into the 20th century, the love of print, paper, binding, provenance, and rarity actually translates well into the digital age in a kind of non-intuitive way. High quality images capture all the glory of the originals. Online metadata tells the story of where these amazing things come from. And open access and the viral nature of the web turn rarity into ubiquity. Now libraries of books and maps like the JCB can share their holdings with everyone. And cultural institutions are beginning to see that providing online access to their materials is in fact a core mission that stands next to collecting and preservation, and that all three activities work seamlessly together in the world of paper and digital. That's what I hope will happen here at Brown and JCB. And the scholars who become JCB fellows in the next 50 years will benefit from these new digital technologies and tools, which have the potential to lead them to exciting new questions 
and solutions as the humanities embraces the digital age. For those of us fortunate enough to have been involved with the beginning of this process at JCB, we will always remember Haiti as our inspiration. Thanks very much. I'm so glad you got to hear that because I've been privately hearing it for a number of years just thinking, I wish everyone could hear this. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing personal story. And it's amazingly generous because David, as you can tell, wants us all to have the same kind of experience. And he, by the way, I forgot to mention, has given his entire map collection to Stanford University, who, which is now building a map center that I'm sure will be transformative in, in its way. So, in many ways, I feel David is allowing us 166 years after the founding of the JCB to realize the ambitions of John Carter Brown in, in a way that he could not in the 19th century. But we certainly can study visual images and written text together better than we ever have um, before. So uh, we, we were going to have a conversation. We might want to hurry it along because we've had, we have uh, friends around the world listening in who also want to talk to you about Haiti um, and are very, very grateful to them. I, I think we were lucky in a lot of ways. You know, we were flying a bit by the seat of our pants through some of this, and Haiti became the first place for all these experiments, and it was really a, a great serendipity that it did. Um, and I want to go back to my own time as a fellow here in the 90s. I was trying to work on African music in, in the 13 colonies, and I just kept getting pulled into Caribbean documents the way the JCB does that to you, and fell in love, I guess, in a way with Haitian history. I just felt the way, now it's a commonplace, but to me it came with the force of a new revelation that why didn't anyone ever tell me about this third revolution? I knew about the American and the French Revolution, and didn't know anything about it, and I, I just read C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins, and thought this is an incredible story, and thank God there's a library that holds the records. And as we were starting to um, work on what the, what the first project would be, I think Haiti emerged for a number of reasons. It was one a very simple reason. It was the right number of books. It's about 1,000 books. And we didn't want too massive a collection. We wanted a, a reasonable number of books to put online. And we wanted a nice combination of maps and texts, and that seemed right. And uh, the, uh, the personal passion had something to do with it. I cared about Haiti's history. Um, and David and I just were talking, and it just seemed like that would be a good way to begin. And we were well into the planning of it when the earthquake of January 2010 hit. And that gave all of this more urgency than it ever had before that. Um, I, I won't say it was fortunate because it was a tragedy, but it, it clarified things. And it made us feel good about putting these things out there because it only, it not only increases access, but it, it in a way increases the security of the original document it, itself. Um, we take very good photographs now of every page of every book we have, which is a way of enhancing the security of an item. If it gets stolen, we know what it looks like down to the green of the paper. Um, but it also clarified the important question, which we had wrestled with for a long time. Do we charge money for the access to these treasures? Which really was a hard question about three or four years ago. And our, our board thought very seriously about it. And we did have a large offer from EBSCO for a while that, that they then retracted. But it, you know, we had the feeling we might make a fair amount of money by charging access. But then we just came around. And da David, I gave David full credit for this, for first the philosophical vision that we wanted open access, and then Second, he personally made it possible. We, had, we decided we want open access, and then we had to raise the money. And then he just said, well, I'm just going to give you the money. So that, you know, in both of those ways, he made it possible. But we knew by providing Haitian artifacts online, we were not going to charge the people of Haiti access to these documents. And so, so it just from the very beginning said, OK, the JCB 
is now open access. And that really was a, a, a very new thing in the world of rare book libraries. And so for all of those reasons, I, I thank David. And um, I don't know if you want to follow up on Haiti specifically, but one, one breakthrough, David mentioned it, was we realized just putting up access to the books wasn't quite enough. We needed to offer something kind of analogous to what, <coughs> what you experience when you come into the JCB. It's a little overwhelming to consider all of the books, so you need to talk to a curator, and that's a fantastic step. We heard from Susan yesterday, and you've all mm -hmm. been talking to Dennis and Ken and Susan Newbery and all of our great staff, and we wanted to provide an equivalent of that online, so we, we created a new website called Remember Haiti, which described the collection in general terms, created a few broad categories. It's, it's kind of the equivalent of a coffee table book that then gives you, it points you towards the comprehensive collection online at the Internet Archive. But it's a, it's a calm place to just think about Haiti and the JCB's collections before going into the very large number of books at the Internet Archive. And I think that, that was a, a, a small breakthrough that we, we had too, so. It, it was indeed, and it, it actually came out of our board deliberations a little bit. We, want, we didn't know, is this a publication or is it a database? What's the difference? And the board was very engaged in this intellectually. And so we came out with the idea, we'll do the database first, then the interpretation will follow with websites. And what now seeing at this conference, what can follow still scholarly work that comes out of these books can be related as well. So. And I, I should also thank Jean Casimir and Patrick Tardieu are going to be with us. But and they in particular, those two people, but a lot of Haitians really uh, bought into this very early. Um, Michel Pierre-Louis, the former prime minister of Haiti, came a few years ago to give a talk. And she's a librarian herself, and she understood instantly what it meant. And we were really lucky that the community of people who care about Haiti's history is very special. And it includes people, obviously, in Haiti. We've got two on the call. But people in Canada, um, a lot of uh, people from the Haitian diaspora throughout the United States, and then uh, in Paris. Uh, Paris has its own complicated history with Haiti, just as the United States does. And uh, Parisian institutions were also helpful. The French National Library has a commitment to put its things online for free also. And I, I should, we're very, very different from the Library of Congress and the British Library and the French National Library, but those three institutions in particular have been putting things online for free for over a decade. And that creates tremendous pressure on everyone. Else. It's hard to go into a for-profit model when the big national libraries are doing that. So I'm, I'm personally grateful to them for the leadership they provide. And Jim Billington at the Library of Congress created the World Digital Library that David mentioned. So he's another visionary. Um, so. We might, why don't we turn it over to Katie Sampak, who will then connect us to our friends around the world. Can we, can David and I take questions during them? So why don't, I'd like very much to make a comment. All right. How privileged the library and the board has been to have you, David, the entrepreneur and the visionary that you have brought to us, uh, how can we compete with the French government in terms of providing free access? This little library of ours is more powerful as a state <coughs> of what people can do uh, than the French library. Well, there is a way. We're not only we're not <laughs> like competing with them, but I would say we're. No, not okay. well, can't, you can't. Well, we're not even trying to, but we. Maybe it's at thanks been to. There since Thanks to David, we are improving upon the great national libraries because they scan. Well, our Napoleon is sitting right next to me. Well, <laughs> and this came out in his talk, but I want to just. Real oligarch. I want to repeat how important this was. We needed to figure out how to do it the JCB way. We didn't want to just scan haphazardly. And so, one really important breakthrough that David pioneered was. Instead of, you know, with Google scanning, you basically get the words on a white background. It doesn't look that great. And a lot of early scanning by the great national libraries is the same way. And specifically, many of them did their scans through microfilm, 
which was the previous technology. And so you get little flecks of black on, the, on your monitor. It's a sort of third generation photograph. And David insisted, and this I think is his artsy background, and it really helped all of us, that we will take new photographs, high resolution and in color, because a page is not white, a page is off-white. And the, there are different degrees of blackness of the type. And you, you saw him zoom in on a piece of type. And so it's like a work of art. And we pull back to see the binding. And the first photo is the cover. And then you start turning the pages. So we look at each of our books as a unique object, not just as a mass of words. And that, that was doing it the JCB way with high quality. And that, that was David's vision. Congratulations for doing it in the JCB. Thanks, Ari. We have a few minutes while we're setting up, so just any questions for David uh, out there? It's a lot, lot to take in. And by the way, I can barely work a laptop, but I just, I just knew this was a good way to go. Um, I'm not that tech savvy by myself, but Jenny. I was very inspired by Darwin Fly. I would like to travel with him. I'm curious to you, how have you stayed abreast of the new technologies and, and, and the possibilities of that? It's all collaboration. So I didn't know how to build in virtual worlds. I, I hadn't done anything. I, I wasn't going to have time to learn it, so I collaborated with a group in Los Angeles that had worked with the University of Virginia building virtual Rome, which some of you might have seen. Uh, yeah, right. It's all collaboration. I collaborated with multiple groups, the gentleman in Switzerland to build that other tool. Uh, that's the way you do it. You, you I know a lot of historians have come myself among that. We are really just beginning to realize the possibilities of using these tools and of layering maps and, you know, and different kinds of maps. And it's, it's very exciting. Uh, I think you help us see where we can go. Thank you. you. David mentioned virtual Rome, and one idea, I'll throw it out there for a business meeting, is if a few of us got together and worked out a proposal and then got funding, we could create a 3D model of a city in a certain year. It could be Port-au-Prince 1791, or Cartagena, Colombia, or Rio, or um, George Washington's estate at Mount Vernon. And put a lot of our expertise and a lot of David's maps uh, into the creation of a site that would have avatars walking down streets um, in a way that's a bit like television. It's a bit like those old animatronic models you might have seen at Disneyland. Uh, you went there in the 1950s and 60s. Um, it's a bit like older scale models. I remember as a kid going into Widener Library, some of you might remember the three models of Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 17th and 18th centuries. And we can start to create 3D worlds to go into. And I, I'm not quite sure how, but I encourage you to think in your work about stepping back and think, building something like, like virtual realm for the, the history that we study. Well, the, the technology is amazing. And I think it's also continuously evolving and widely distributed and requires at some level for historians to gain a new set of skills to actually make use of it. How do we both keep track of what's going on and learn how to use it and do the rest of what we do? Because it's important to do all of that. There's no aggregator that says, here's your window into everything. It, it's a great question, and it's, uh, I think all universities are struggling with what kinds of support services are needed within departments. How does the library retool itself? I know Harriet is thinking a lot of the, about that at Brown. It's got to come from either departments or from the library. You know, it's, it's, they're going to have to help you. Uh, as librarians move away from being sort of active reference librarians, they essentially are retooling themselves as software advisors. So I think that's where it's going It just takes time. Yeah. You know, when I show it looks very easy here because I work with it so much, but my point is not to suggest it's coming tomorrow, but just to give a look at what it might be. And I think over time it will.
what, what I'm wrestling with a little bit is um, you all come in with a pretty clear sense of what you want to do. You want to just get access to books. You've thought hard about them before you get here, but can we offer certain kinds of training like this, like some digital training just as a bonus? And might that enhance the JCB Fellows experience? And I think it should be optional. I don't think it should be required, but I think it might be a nice uh, addendum to the, the Fellows experience. So. Yeah. When we're here, it's here to have a hundred anniversary of Fellows program. And at some point in the intervening years, there is open access to every item in the JCB collection. What does the Fellows program look like then? Well, that question touches upon the relationship between the original physical artifact and the digital copy. And I've never I felt that the one replaced really the other. Them. I mean, I think the two go together. And Rolena said it very nicely. It makes our precious objects even more precious. And I, I do think there's nothing like holding it in your hand. And, and you see things in, it's in your hand that you don't see online. I, I also think the opposite is true. I think you see things online that you don't necessarily see holding the original in your hand. As a scholar, one benefit I really appreciate is that very few of our books have indexes in the back. And now with OCR, as David said, you can just put in Raynal, and you know everywhere Abbe Raynal is mentioned in, in a book. You just have to read every page of a JCB book. Now you don't have to. Um, but I think the two do, uh, I, I think there will always be value in coming here, um, a huge value uh, uh, was said by Neil Safir yesterday, which is the value of schmoozing. We like to we like each other. We like to talk in the in the hallways. Um, we Neil said it was hard to look at the Del Borgo exhibit during the opening reception because he was so interested in talking to everybody. And that's that's what we want. The, ex the exhibition isn't going away. You can sneak back there, but we we want you to spend social time together. That's a big part of this experience. That's a, a huge benefit of the house that we never had before. Is that Fellows live together and eat meals together, and, and they sign the guest book in the house where we're going for lunch today, and write the most beautiful things in that guest book about just that benefit of the experience. And that has pretty little to do with the books in the library, but that's really more and more what, what we offer. Um, so I think people will still like seeing the original books. That will never go away. They will always like seeing each other. But we want to make sure that more and more people know about centuries that are increasingly, I mean, every day we move forward the 18th centuries further in the past. We want to keep those centuries hot and interesting and fellows coming back for more. So I think this is a form of advertising in, in addition to just providing open access. And we see no drop, drop in the numbers of applications for fellowships so far. So. I, I'd agree with that. I, I think it's both and in every way. Uh, I also think the other thing is you'll be, as well as you'll be able to work with the library way beyond the time you're here. Because you'll have access to the whole thing. That, that's a huge point. I'm hoping to get out in the business meeting, but I'm, I believe in some abstract sense that I don't know quite how to make it uh, practical yet, but that you will never stop being fellows, that you'll go back to where, where you come from, and you'll just call up the book that you were reading a day before in Providence, and you'll read it online. And you'll never lose it. that connection. Yeah. Margo? Leslie has a letter from Melvin. Oh. The JCB Internet Archive Collaborative, which I learned about at a conference at Harvard, where Ted Wimmer memorably presented the project, turned out to be literally indispensable. I remember turning to the scanned version of Morrowind's seminary, even at the page proof stage for a last minute check. I put profound thanks to David Rumsey and the Press Foundation, as well as the JCB for making my work and that of many others possible. So our curators may turn into more sort of online facilitators. You know, they'll be helping you here, but also there'll be maybe 20 emails in a day. I'm having trouble getting Moreau to San Marie to work on my, and that, you know, we'll be providing you help in Australia or South America or wherever, wherever you are. I can hear you. I can hear you. We're all, are we almost ready for our, our friends around the world? Yeah, Ted, we need just two minutes to test the sound. Okay. Um, we see there are plenty of questions, so that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah, okay. It's just one minute. Any other questions? Robin, can you hear me? 
I couldn't stand. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to go back to you for a comment. <laughs> so, we can come down and be a fellow. Yeah, so, right. I'm going to come down and be a fellow periodically. And, you know, like 10 years ago, then we, all just, we couldn't see that material for maybe another five or six years. Well, you have to make sure the British Library, which is expensive. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear you? Allow me to do the travel. Okay, good. What well, seems to me is that this allows us to continue the preparations of the friendship. You actually work on the material, as you just said. So you actually don't leave the JCB when you have your fellowship ends. So I'm quite excited by this this morning. I'm working on a new project, and I think, well, I can do a lot of that from home, but I can communicate down to the JCB, and I can communicate to other people, and I can see the stuff. So I don't have to think about getting the funding, finding five weeks to leave home and do this. So I think it's really revolutionizes, and it's, the fellowships actually just expand. That's exactly right. And I, I'd like to, to take that as a segue into this session, section now with the panelists that are joining us remotely. Um, and I'm sorry to say we've lost our Haitian um, members. Um, we're trying to recover them. And, and so we may be able to, if you were here early before the session started, you um, probably saw Jean Casimir and Patrick Tardieu and uh, and they were and I want to thank all of the panelists. I, I find them very intrepid to <laughs> be willing to take part. Yeah, they've in this. been waiting for hours yeah. for their laptops to join us. So yeah, we're very grateful. To yes, them. and uh, and I want to take just a couple minutes to introduce myself and to the and uh, the different panel members, and then we'll just each panel member will make a brief statement, and then we'll have a question and answer session because I think everybody has lots of comments and questions. Um, and so I am, my name is Katie Sampak, and I'm on the faculty at Illinois State University. And I was a fellow here from 2008 to 2009. And I have to say, they are, it was probably six of the most glorious months of my life. <laughs> and, and like you were saying, that you don't stop becoming a fellow. I think it's really more joining a family. And, and a network seems a, sort of a cold, way to phrase it, so it, it really is more of a family, and that, um, that the connections, this theme of connections is very important because I met people here that some of them I eventually would have met, but meeting them sooner has made a tremendous difference. And then I met other people that I probably never would have met, but because I met them, they made a profound impact on the directions of my research, and I think that's true of, of, of all the fellows, that it's, it's, it's this great effervescence, uh, you know, intellectual environment that I found profoundly satisfying. And, and I think this panel today, I mean, the, the tremendous contributions of generosity, um, um, uh, creativity, and, and real leadership by David Rumsey for the JCB is, is, is tremendous too. And, and thinking of new ways and new directions and ways to, to get into the material like never before. Um, as a Latin American scholar, I can say that I am continually impressed by the need for scholars to connect to primary sources, which the fellowship program is, is, is an important way to do that. But then this digital access is a way for that to continue and to broaden that world to the people that really uh, need it most critically um, in many ways. And, and then the other part of this is through these digital connections, we can become a better community of scholars that we can um, talk to, work with, collaborate with people in all different parts of the world. On, with these materials, and, and so this panel is just a little um, sample or a little step in that direction of making these connections of scholars with each other. Um, so today um, we're joined by a couple of people who know the JCB only through the digital co co collections. One is Robin Derby, who's on the faculty of the University of California at Los Angeles. 
Um, she, a recent book of hers is The Dictator's Seduction, Politics, and the Popular Imagination in the Era of Trujillo, and she won the 2010 Bolton Johnson Prize um, from the Council on Latin American History. Um, and uh, uh, Laurel Senley is um, on the faculty at the College of Holy Cross. A recent book of hers is Mother is Gold, Father is Glass, Gender and Colonialism in Yoruba Town. And she was a fellow in 2011. And uh, then um, Philip Zakir is on the faculty at California State University at Fullerton. And his, a recent book of his is Haiti and the Haitian Diaspora in the wider Caribbean. And so thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And um, each member is going to make a brief statement now. And we'll start with Robin Derby. We're just going in alphabetical order. So Robin, go ahead. OK. Well, I wanted to um, first say something about um, the JC book the John Carter Brown's book, which I've used in my own research project. And um, my current research project is on demonic animal narratives, which is um, in, in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It's really a, um, a project which, first and foremost, is an oral history project. But what I'm trying to do is um, look, at the, uh, look at the key symbols in my, in my stories from contemporary period, dogs, pigs, cattle, um, and would and look at them in a the long array. Uh, and so as a, as a non-colonialist, I probably was very shy about, you know, uh, you know, becoming, trying to become a fellow at JCB because, you know, my, my, I'm, I'm bridging two different er periods. But, um, but I want to say that it's been really fabulous to look at a couple things in particular. Because one, one puzzle in my stories is why the dog figures is this terrifying force in all of my contemporary narratives. And I, I want to argue in my project that this has to do with the real history of dogs, which we use during the nation of revolution to catch slaves. Um, and there are a couple of uh, JCB materials which I've used to great effect um, for this project. One is Rainsford's historical account of the Black Empire of Haiti, which has, it starts off with a picture of one of the dogs that was brought. Um, these were uh, dogs trained and packed dogs. They were brought uh, in from heat from Cuba. Um, and they, were, they started off in, the, in Jamaica during the Maroon War, which just predated the Haitian Revolution, um, where they were used to great effect. Um, and so, you know, in unearthing the kind of terrifying history of how these dogs became used um, as attack dogs to chase down and eat alive slaves, um, I also used Dallas History of the Maroon, which is, which is actually um, a, a book on the history of the Maroon War, but it gives, it gives a lot of detail on the use of attack dogs in, in Jamaica. So, so I, you know, these are some of the sources I'm using in my new project for um, on the history of the use of animals. But I've also been looking at some of the other JCB materials for this project because um, I'm interested in the perceptions of the wild as they, as they change and sort of local knowledge about the environment. And to those to that end, I've been reading with with great interest the. Um, the work of De Contilis, who's a, who's a French botanist who, who got stuck in Haiti during the Haitian Revolution and um, ended up writing some extraordinary uh, botanical uh, kind of, they're sort of descriptions of botanical materials, but what's really striking is that almost every entry uh, in recalls slave knowledge because he really had to rely on, um, on the maroon to get his, to excavate the uses of these herbs and, and plants, which he wasn't familiar with. So, so those are the, some of the things that um, that I've been using from the JCB collection, and you know, it's been it's been really fabulous. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, my, I and mean, I think this is a, an extraordinary um, development that we've got this extraordinary archive of, of Haitian material. Um, I, in particular, think this is obviously a really important boon for scholars of Haiti in Haiti because it's, you know, the archive, you know, <laughs> anyone who's tried to work in Haitian materials on the island knows it's very difficult. Um, so, so having this extraordinarily rich collection is a huge, um, it's, it's a huge resonance for, for Haitian scholars on the island. I, I also think that concretely this could, this could build in two different ways. I think 
this, this collection now affords potential for collaboration between Haitian scholars on the island and those of us in, in the U.S. to work together on key text. And I think that could, that could be really, really helpful. But another thing that um, I became aware of last August, I actually taught a course at the University of Haiti um, with Watson Denis, both oracle um, methodology. And we have these fabulous students from um, from the Bureau de Ethnologie and um, Sciences uh, Sociales um, and the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And they were really fabulous. And I became aware of the fact that Patients, um, in order to graduate with their um, BA, they have to write a thesis, and you know it's, it's a challenge for them to get access to our to primary sources, um, to work with a mentor, and I think you know potentially I could see also this open access material as enabling um, you know U.S. scholars to work with Haitian nationals as they're as they're working on their theses, and I think that that would be really um, a wonderful thing to to think about how we can promote that kind of work because it's, it's a real problem. A lot of students don't finish their BAs because they don't have, um, they just don't have the guidance or the material to, to get their thesis done. So, so you know, but I, I'm, I'm very, um, it's very an honor for me to be part of this conversation and I, I'm, you know, very uh, heartily enthusiastic, hearty enthusiast for the archives. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, Laurel, are you ready? Yes. Yes, I am ready. Can you hear me okay? Oh, perfectly. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel all the way from Cotonou and Benin. And I apologize, but my, my connection is not very good, so I can't hear that well. Um, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, as uh, was said, I was a fellow uh, at the JCB uh, last summer. And as an Africanist who is new to the study of Haitian history, my experience at the JCB really worked hand in hand with the um, Remember Haiti Digital Library. Um, the Haitian Revolution is one um, part, it's a crucial and foundational part of a much larger project that I'm working on on black citizenship during French colonial empire. Uh, so in looking at the Haitian Revolution, I'm interested in sort of understanding the, the timeline and the context, uh, understanding the, of course, the huge <coughs> historiography, and then thirdly, um, the other questions related to West Africa and France itself. Um, and being a JCB fellow, in particular, um, provided me with the much-needed face time with different members of the library staff who were really instrumental in leading me towards certain items um, that were uh, available there. And there, there are three particular items that were useful to me. Um, one was, and I think this was discussed a bit in the opening uh, uh, talk of the bits and pieces I could hear, uh, maps, uh, the maps were very uh, important. Maps of the cop really led me to think of um, sort of focusing my um, project around different cities. Um, the volumes on the affiche américaine, um, which are very thick volumes, and some of them have been digitized and some of them um, patent been, um, but just sort of seeing them uh, really allows you to get a sense of the, of the, of the documentation and the voluminous nature of it. And then, and then finally, the uh, last thing was a rare edition of uh, Toussaint Louverture's uh, 1801 Constitution. Um, and the, the provenance of the Constitution is still uh, here, but um, the, the, the different way that it was written really uh, showed me the connections made between emancipation, marriage, citizenship, and, and nation building, and that was really instrumental in my understanding of this part of my project. Um, and uh, again, it, you know, having the, the items that are digitized uh, alongside the items that are not, and even if things are partially digitized, to see them in, in person is always very useful because when you see them in person, they come alive for you and they can inspire you when you see their size or their weight or their packaging. Now, once my fellowship was over, I was able to, of course, go back to the digital library again and again. And that was very important because I think that as, um, I think of primary and secondary sources as a uh, particular puzzle that scholars, individual scholars put together in their own special way. So having the fellowship experience and being able to go back and look at the key documents and foundational texts in Haitian uh, history 
has allowed me to uh, research and learn and create, you know, all at the same time um, as I uh, puzzle over the Haitian Revolution, among other things. So um, uh, I look forward to our uh, discussion and, and any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank Laura. you, Philippe. Are, are you ready? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me very well. Uh, unfortunately, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, unfortunately, unfortunately, I missed uh, half of uh, David Brent's uh, speech, and I'm very, very sorry about that. So, uh, but maybe we'll, we can talk about it later. So, uh, I would like to, to thank you, Catherine, and the, the organizing committee of the GSCB. Library table for uh, inviting me to join your discussion this morning, although I, I was never say at uh, JCB. Um, as far as I remember, um, uh, I have always made it a point uh, to teach um, the story of colonial phenomena and the uh, Asian Revolution. Since the beginning of my career, I have found that um, um, many history textbooks treat the subject very poorly or only passing uh, a short paragraph from the Simulator 2, for example, opportunistically located at a, the very end of a chapter, otherwise dedicated to the French Revolution, rarely does justice to the extraordinary wealth and complexity of men uh, and his characters. Unfortunately, uh, World History Textbook kind of the only college student oriented publication where I have found the coverage of the uh, uh, colonial phenomenon and the uh, Asian Revolution a lacking depth and uh, interesting. <coughs> it is only recently that major colonialist American history textbooks, for example, have added significant material uh, on the subject matter. So I have um, devoted an increasingly important phase to uh, the origins, uh, development, and legacy of the Asian Revolution in my reproduction classes on the history of colonialism in America, on the history of race and ethnicity in Latin America, but also uh, in my lower division history of world, uh, world civilization. I believe the, the story of the domain Haiti provides us with fantastic opportunities to engage dialogue with students uh, on such difficult and controversial topics as uh, slavery, colonialism, race and liberty, and the story of creolization. It is particularly my earth-revision classes that I have encouraged uh, students to choose Haiti as their topic of research. So when they did so, uh, they quickly faced the hurdle, a very serious hurdle, uh, uh, which was the lack of readily accessible primary sources. It is in this respect that um, I think that the JCB library, throughout uh, digital collection of AP, will be of uh, invaluable for, uh, for me, for myself, and of course for my Latin American history students. I have found the Remember um, Haiti website particularly appealing. Uh, it contains a raw Exodus resources uh, and it is within that. The digital archive, uh, such as this one, can help envision, uh, I believe, new strategies uh, to teach uh, the story of the domain Haiti uh, in ways that, um, that are accessible. Uh, and um, effective. For example, um, a major discussion session on racial issues in revolutionary in re in revolutionary um, I can assign a, a different document to a student or several groups of students. The wealth of the uh, GDP digital collection makes it possible uh, to bring into the classroom discussion as many perspectives as possible. Uh, I find it, for instance, enjoyable to discuss uh, Julien Mimon's perspective on the Jean de Couleur and uh, confront it to accounts of this Aline's uh, campaign against Rigo uh, in any group of us in you. So, uh, if students or students have the possibility to read their source, 
but also their classmates would um, as well uh, in the comfort of their home or anywhere uh, they wish as long as they have access to the uh, in the internet. We're attending the general discussion, you can start with CG ideas, uh, online discussion boards, chat platform, or titanium. So I think there are many ways that we can uh, that we can put the comments there, we can do ideas, uh, we both presented interesting information and uh, that's new to them. We can also mention things difficult to grasp, shocking. Um, in uh, particularly the, the picture of the bloodhounds attacking the black family in Rainford, uh, historical accounts of the black empire baby. And I was really happy to be here, uh, of course, to read the uh, Robin's uh, paper uh, about that. So it's very sorry. So as for my own research on late 19th century Haiti uh, in the relations with its Caribbean neighbors, the collection has been uh, less useful because of the tendency for colonial movement in the military period. My hope uh, is that the project is extended uh, much further to include uh, the critical text uh, from Haiti's first uh, historians, but also from 19th century uh, political actors in those. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Philip. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions now for for our panelists or others for Todd or David. Or for the panelists, do you have questions for each other or for David Ramsey or <laughs> people here? <laughs> Well, one question I might have is whether the JCB has um, any plans to uh, to kind of, I mean, what are your plans in terms of this, this whole digital conferencing technology? I've never been exposed to before. I think it's extraordinarily brave, um, but it also, I think, offers wonderful opportunities to bring patients on the island to the conversation, you know, to bring faculty from, from UES to UEH into, into the conversation. And, you know, I think that could, this could be a really um, extraordinary uh, technology to, to you know, maybe have some conferences around particular primary sources in the JCB room of covering the And I don't know if there are plans to, um, you know, to expand this kind of, you know, is, I don't even know in the history of your own use of this technology, have you used this frequently? Have you done this before? Um, <laughs> that, that's a very good question. I would be thrilled if more Haitians came to the JCB in person as a result of this session. I expect that they will. We've had a pretty l small number, uh, I think one Haitian in my six years. Um, but this, as I said earlier, is a form of advertising, so I think we'll get more scholars coming. Um, as we also said, you, you now can simulate the fellowship experience merely by staying in Haiti and reading these books online, so um, I, I, I hope that will happen. But everyone who was involved in the creation of this site is working along those, uh, to, towards those goals. Uh, Jean Casimir, who was supposed to be on this and may even still be, he, we saw him when we came in this morning a little before 10. He's the former ambassador to the United, <coughs> to the United States. And <coughs> he came here not too many months after the site went live and had a really interesting and really hard question, which was how do we simulate this site for people who do not have internet access in Port-au-Prince? Could I make a little lab in my university in Port-au-Prince with some special um, storage devices, some large storage devices? Could we put the roughly 1,100 books and maps onto these storage devices, and I'll just bring them with me back to Haiti. And it took some time, and Leslie may want to say two days. No, it took two DVDs to put the entire collection on two but, DVDs, which he was able to take back. Wow. But there were complications in getting to that. It, it wasn't quite as simple as that at first. You had to write a script to right. download it all at once. Right. The problem was um, making a sort of 
database so that you could access it. Right. So, yeah. so you know, each act of innovation spurs other innovations. So Jean came up with what worked for him, and now he's got all of our books in his, he's a professor now, a former ambassador, but, but a professor in, uh, in Haiti. <coughs> and Patrick Tardieu, who came um, under sort of emergency circumstances, he came to us in the uh, immediate aftermath of the earthquake. He's the a curator of the oldest library in Haiti, the Bibliothèque des Pères du Saint-Esprit. And that building was literally falling over, but in slow motion. It, it fell over about two months, and it did fall. And in that two months, we were able, with some JCB help, um, some fundraising here, to, to pay for people to go in and work and move the books out to safety. They moved them to a church. So the books were saved. The building fell, and now they're, they're building a new, new one. But Patrick came and was a, a really helpful advisor on bibliographical questions. So as we were entering our, our cataloging information, he was really very helpful. He's a walking en encyclopedia of Haitian printing history. And he was able also to spread the word around the US of a, of a need, which is there hasn't been a really solid bibliography of works printed in Haiti um, since um, the early 1950s. And in fact, that Haitian bibliographer managed to comb the United States without coming to the JCB. So our books aren't even in that bibliography. So we really need a new Haitian bibliography. And I think Patrick may be that person I think he would like to be, and uh, he's working on getting funding now. So all of it, once that bibliography is created, that will call attention to all known copies of all Haitian books in the world. And pretty soon, I think, you're just going to go from a bibliography online. There'll be a link in the catalog online. It'll just hit, and you'll see the book itself. So it'll be a great boon to Haitian scholarship. So. Um, I got a little off topic, but all of this, I hope, will help actual Haitians themselves come here or, or study the books online, because that's the whole intent. The intent is, is not merely to restrict it to scholars of Haitian history, but really to provide full access to Haitian people themselves. And in my dealings with, with them, I have never met a people more proud of their history than the Haitian people. I mean, Americans are plenty proud of George Washington and Jefferson and our other founders, but Haitians really live with Toussaint and with Dessalines and others in a way that I've not encountered elsewhere. Would you say that's true, David? Yeah, they really, I mean, they're Toussaint is on t-shirts of people walking around Port-au-Prince, so it's really um, visceral for them. And um, I might add, it's great having David Gekas here to always tell us what what he thinks we might modify if we had get something a little. We're doing this fast, so we need the scholars. We need you to help help make sure that everything we put out there is is also true. So. And, and I do think that this web conferencing technology will help um, bring bring the scholarship right. to the JCB for people that really simply can't travel right. for different reasons right. or doesn't, for it to fit in their schedule. Right. Like like our panelists here, we're just so tremendously <laughs> lucky that you're able to join us this morning. Um, I think there's a, yeah. I had a question for Philippe Zaker. Uh, can, can you, I think you can uh, go to the mic if sorry. you don't mind. Yes. I'm sorry. So he can hear you. I don't yes. think he'll be able to hear you. So Philippe, you have a question? This is a question for Philippe Zaker. I think you were talking about your current research on diplomatic relationships between the Republic of Haiti uh, and Caribbean neighbors. Now, I was just wondering, in, in terms of the conversation we've been having today, how much of that kind of research are you able to do with internet uh, resources? Uh, and, and to what extent do you have to travel? And what, uh, sorry, are you able to He can't hear you. So, so your question is, um, how much research, Philippe, are you able to do uh, using internet resources for the inter-Caribbean relationships, and how much do you have to actually travel to go to Martinique or Guadeloupe to, to do your research? Did you hear me? <laughs> yes, OK. I got the question. Well, in fact, um, um, 
But um, I had to travel um, quite a bit to uh, to collect the material that I needed for uh, for my research. Um, well, basically, I'm working on the relations between uh, between the Haitian Republic, Haitian citizens in their uh, Afro Caribbean neighbors, and uh, I am particularly looking at uh, the migrations of the uh, Caribbeans to Haiti. Um, especially from the 1830s uh, until the very beginning of the 20th century. And uh, right now, um, I am uh, concentrating on the arrival of uh, people from Guadeloupe uh, in Martinique, uh, in Paul France, uh, after, well, before and of course after the abolition of slavery in French uh, in uh, 1848. So for my research, in fact, I had to uh, to travel uh, quite a bit. So uh, much of my uh, preliminary research uh, was conducted uh, in Paris. Um, and in Paris, uh, I found, uh, in fact, most of the, uh, the material I have seen so far. Uh, for example, the Ministère de la Culture, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, in France, and in fact, I will be in Paris uh, in four days actually, traveling to, to France uh, this coming Thursday to, uh, to keep on doing the, the research. So, uh, similarly, I had to, to travel. I, I spent, uh, in fact, uh, a year uh, in Guadeloupe um, and it, um, about um, uh, two years ago. Uh, again, uh, working the archives in order to collect the material. And in fact, little, I couldn't find anything, in fact, on the internet that uh, uh, related to, uh, to my research. So it's been very, well, there, and as I said in my uh, introductory, introductory remarks, and so it, uh, um, it, it could be, um, yeah, of course, I really heard, uh, um, it would be amazing, uh, of course, for um, um, like people working on the 19th century maybe to have the, the collection um, extended to that uh, to that period. Amazing. Um, the, the collection is already um, wonderful, um, and um, as I said, um, um, I could see. Uh, um, be doing many things with my students with the collection uh, at the GDB. Uh, but um, I think that it would be great to, to extend uh, to, to the 19th century. And maybe to the 20th century as well. I don't know. Philippe, uh, I'm going to be in Paris in seven days, and Paul Cohen also, so maybe we can get a coffee together. <laughs> I, I, heard you, uh, I heard you were going to be first, but I did not hear the first of this. I just, one of the marvels of this technology is we can arrange coffee now in front of the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we've run out of time, um, but I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, especially our panelists again. and. And I hope this is just the first of many more to come. Thank you all.